We are back on the Falcons Audible, presented by AT&T. We've got smiles here. DJ's ready. He's flexing. Dave's punching. I'm uh, Arsenio Hallin. Okay. I know for the young people that are watching, you have Never no idea who I'm talking Hall. about, but it's okay. You've got this thing on your computer. Coming to America phone. One. Try there that. You go. There, there you go. go. It's called Google. Put it in Google, everybody. Okay. Go. He's D uh, Dave Archer, DJ Shockley, Derek Rackley. Here is the three uh, that are in charge of this deal, and we are going to talk about. Uh, um, it seems like an eternity ago that yeah. the Atlanta Falcons played Carolina Panthers in Charlotte. Dave, do you remember that? Like I do. Yeah, I was. I was there for it. Yeah, yeah it was. It was uh... yeah. So we're going to talk about that game just a little bit, right? We're going to give you our takes on what happened. We'll talk about a player or a position group that through this point in the season that, hey, you know what, we've been pretty impressed with. They're actually doing a pretty good job. And then we will fast forward. We will talk about the Chicago Bears, next opponent on the schedule for the Atlanta Falcons. But first, Dave, let's talk a little bit about Carolina. Let's go back to Charlotte. Mm. Crappy conditions. Mm. No good. Rain off and on the entire game. Uh, of course, Atlanta comes up short. Why don't you give us our, your synopsis of what you felt like happened? Where did things go wrong? And remember, Dave, we're on a limited time here. Okay? <laughs> Where do well, you think uh, well, things kind of went yeah, wrong? The only, thing it, the only thing that was worse than maybe the weather was the way we played. Yeah. And I think that, that everybody saw that. Uh, you got to block and tackle in this game, as it turns out. And we didn't do any of that in yeah. the game. Let's, yeah. let's be real. Um, couldn't handle Derek Brown. Could not handle Ioannidis in the middle. That created a problem for your quarterback. Now your quarterback's running around. Quarterback made some bad decisions with the football, yep. uh, put it in harm's way, which we can't do. The one thing that does fall on the quarterback, uh, one of the thing, one of the many things that falls on the quarterback, is your ability to minimize damage. So, yeah, things weren't going well. We weren't running with a lot of effectiveness. The quarterback was under siege. Now I got to take care of the ball. I yeah. can't throw the ball to the other team. So that was the the last part of it that didn't work out offensively. The other side of the football had a tough time in the run game. This yeah. is a, they gutted you in the run game, and it wasn't perimeter run game. It was right at you, yep. and you could not stop the interior run game. There's some reasons for that um, that are fixable, I think, um, but that was a problem as well. And then some tackling issues in the back end, I thought, created some maybe some of the, the couple plays they got out where they got explosive. And they weren't overly explosive offensively right, either. Right. But they had a couple plays where tackling was an issue. Yeah, but they kind of, you know, again, gave Atlanta a taste of their own medicine yeah. by pounding the football. And, and that's why so many people, myself included, even though we seem like we're guys in this generation of quarterbacks chucking the ball through the air. If you can run the rock, yeah. if you can dominate the line of scrimmage, good things are going to happen. And that's what we've gotten a chance to see in this game. I mean, Atlanta has not been able to solve this Foreman guy yeah. for Carolina in two games. Like, he's kind of just marched right up and down. And Dave made a good point. And I don't want to sit here and single out one play. But, you know, the one where Mariota scrambles and then he's going down to the ground and he, and he just chucks the ball. And granted, it gets replayed, right? And he's down. Oh. Yeah, but first, you're but thankfully. but you're kind of you right. sitting there like like wh why would we do that yeah right like those are some of the decision making things that it's like if you don't feel like you're going to get out and throw the ball to bounce well shock talk about that because from the time we start learning to take snaps there's a ball security thing that comes into mind what what are some of the things that you remember hearing pounded in your head about taking there the ball well the the number one thing I was always taught was don't turn a bad play into a catastrophe yeah so basically like Art just mentioned. The play's already dead, pretty much, and nothing's really there. And this was, I thought, was the first game that I thought our quarterback tried to force the issue at times. I think there were, you know, he wanted to make the play so bad. And I don't fault him for that, but I just, you know, I, I wanted him, like Arch and you, like you just said, to make better decisions when it's just not there. Sometimes you got to just punt it. Sometimes you just got to throw it away. As bad as that feels, as bad as you may just had two, three and outs, they just went down and scored. You can't make it worse. And I thought a couple times in this ball game, he had ample opportunities just to chuck it in the third row yep. or just eat it. Yep. And the decision to try to force the football and make something happen, and I can understand it. I'll be honest. I've been there before. I've been a guy who hasn't played a lot, and I know we're, you know, like all eight, nine games in a season, and he's played a bunch of football, but it still is a guy who, you know, is trying to prove – not just to the Falcons, but to the rest of the league, that he belongs as a starter and he wants to make plays. So I totally understand. I totally get it. Just in some of those instances, 
the idea of taking care of the football and throwing it away is a lot better than trying to throw it from your back and you can't see the defense. And that's that's a tough thing that he has to kind of get over, I think, in the last couple of games. Yeah, and let and let's 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 be real about this too. One of the reasons he's playing is because of his veteran ability to understand the game. He's been in right. the game for a while. Right. So with experience, a shock in our talking, both of were young players and we played, you had early to play. I got to play early in my career. I made some mistakes like that. But when you're struggling offensively as a coordinator, you got to be able to trust the dude that's got the ball in his hands every snap. Whether you hand it off or throw it to somebody, you got it every snap. So I got to trust to a certain extent. I've called a play and it might not be the best play in the world, but now I'm, I'm turning over the trust that you're going to take care of the ball for me. And this was, as Shock said, was the first time I think this season. Now there's been some mistakes, balls gotten out through an interception or whatever, but not to the degree of that. So that's something he's going to – Marcus is going to have to go back and check his whole card. He's going to look at his tape. He told me right after the game, I did not play well. Those are right out of his mouth. I yep. did not play well. Yep. You can bet he'll be a better player this weekend because that's just who he is. Um, so you, and so, But you are trusting him as a play caller that, okay, here we go. Here's the team. Here's the ball. Mm-hmm. Yep. You take care of it for me. If this thing gets jacked up a little bit, I need, you to, I need to trust you you're going to get rid of it in the right way. Dave, you talked about experience, and that's the reason why he's likely yep. the starting quarterback as it stands right now. And some of the decisions you would think – maybe fall on a guy that's a rookie, right? So there's been this conversation, and I know you kind of made a joke about it, and I want you guys to talk about this as quarterbacks because the the questions, and I'm not trying to create a controversy here, but the questions about if and when is it Desmond Ritter's time to right. get a chance to play. Do you think we're getting close to that, or do you still feel like Marcus Mariota gives Atlanta the best chance to win right now? Right now, I still feel like Marcus is the guy, and I feel like, as much of the things that we saw that we were not encouraged about, there were tons of things that you've seen through this season that has you encouraged, that yep. has you thinking, okay, this guy has kept us in a lot of ball games. He's made a lot of plays. He's made a lot of big-time throws where he had to stand in the pocket. There were a couple of times throughout the year where we needed a big-time play for him, and he made it. So I think as much as you're always looking forward to the next guy and – we were talking about it before we came on. I've been the backup plenty of times in my career, in my life, whether it's college, whether it's been NFL, and you got people on the outside calling you, texting you, you need to be playing, you Put should be the guy. Lee. And yeah, obviously that guy's popular because you ain't seen him play yet. <laughs> so until he gets on the field and he throws another interception or he does have a bad snap or something and looking for the next guy. So I understand why fans are looking forward to the shiny new toy that is yep. Desmond Ritter yep. that you went out and drafted. You saw some good things out of him in preseason, so you're like, oh, we could have that guy behind the thing. But I believe, and ultimately what we just talked about, an experience factor that he brings, the things that he's done this season, I think gives him the advantage right now that he still should be the guy. And we got we to gotta keep it real. As bad as it feels right now, and you're just coming off two straight losses – you're still one game out of the division. You're still one game away from winning this division or being out in front. So uh, I still like some of the things that Marcus has done, but we're talking about 70 plays in a game, and there's three or four that you look at and say, man, I wish you would have did that a little bit differently. Yeah. And there's so many things that never comes up in the stat sheet. There's nothing – there's sometimes you never hear Coach talk about that he does at the line of scrimmage. We watch the game, and you see him go can-can. You see him walking to the line of scrimmage, changing plays. You see him, the running back, having big runs. A lot of times, that's him getting them out of a bad play into a good play. Mm-hmm. But it never comes up. So it's not something that you can tangibly touch yeah. that makes you say, all right, that's the reason why that play works. So there's still a lot of things that he's doing that's really productive and good for this team. Dave, you know, sometimes the grass is greener on the other side. Mm-hmm. Not, it's not always, as you mentioned, right? So it's like you pull the trigger, put a guy in like Desmond Ritter. Maybe it goes well, maybe it doesn't. But what I do know is you mentioned that we got to block better and we got to tackle better. Yeah. We block better, maybe Marcus plays a little bit better. So, but at the end of the day, this is kind of what you get yourself into. If you're not Patrick Mahomes, Josh Allen, Kyler Murray, Justin, Her- Justin Herbert, like these type of things are going to come up. It comes with the territory of being a quarterback and not necessarily a, a established big-time starter. 
are you in agreement? Is he still the guy that needs to stay under center? Yeah, or no question. Shotgun? No question. Just because of all the things Shock just talked about, because yeah. of all the things he's doing for the team. Remember, if Desmond gets on the field, and he probably will at some point during the season, they'll give him a chance maybe. Um, providing, you know, if we keep going the way we're going, then there's definitely that's we're going to trend towards that direction. But this thing is still in doubt. You still get Tampa one more time. But what happens if, if you put the young QB in and he's got some ability? And by the way, he's, there's, this com- there's this conversation about him. Is he ready to play? He's not ready to play. That's why he's not playing. If he weren't ready to play, he wouldn't be the backup. Yep. Right. Okay, let's yep. clarify that. Now, being ready to play and being able to hold control, control everything that Marcus is controlling is two different things. Yep. Yep. You just talked about all the things he's doing. So that would be a pared down scenario for him. But what Marcus is, if you get, think about the, the end of the game. Everything, everything that went on, we went into two minutes. And what Marcus do? Right down the field. Took you right down the field yep. through a touchdown pass. Yep. Okay. Yep. And that was with with some degree of protection. Yeah. Okay. And he even scrambled in that one, went to the left and threw one back across the bird across the, bird, the field, yeah. twisting and made an unbelievable throw to bird along the sideline. So you can see it. It's there. He can yep. get it done. Yep. Help him out a little bit. Yep. Give him a little bit of help and don't put him under duress completely like we did this last weekend. And you got some things. And let's be uh, the you start talking about the NFL week to week. This is a completely different matchup this yeah. week. Yeah. You know, to think that this is a, okay, oh, my God, this is the way it's going to be all year long. No. Think about all the weeks, how different they've been each week. He was the, he was the NFC player of the week a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let, let's, let's keep that in perspective. And that's what happens is we lose perspective a little bit. Yep. All right, so let's go ahead. Let's let's put a bow on that one we mentioned. Yep. That was a few days ago. Let's move forward because, again, that's what the players and the coaches are doing. So Chicago will be coming here. A um, little bit of a – you could call it a mini bye week, if you will, because mm-hmm. you, you had to turn around so quickly last week. So maybe some guys get a chance to get their feet underneath them. Maybe we get a couple more guys back out on the field that have not been recently. But all that aside, because we can't control any of that, Dave – let me let me ask you this: Who is Chicago right now? Who who are the Atlanta Falcons playing this week, and where are the Bears in the scope of their season strengths, Real weaknesses, Bears. and and where do you feel like they can attack? Well, what you're going to see is a very similar version offensively that we play. They want to run the football. Uh, David Montgomery is an outstanding running back from Iowa State, <laughs> but he's, Iowa State. He's, he's, like, oh, <laughs> no good good running back. Um, he, he he reminds me a lot of our guy in Tyler Algier. His ability, he runs with good power. He's got more juice than you think he has, and he's a good receiver out of the backfield. So a multi-purpose guy. You've got a quarterback that can run. Uh, uh, Justin Fields is ripped. He's leading them in rushing. He leads the, the Bears in rushing. He's had two back-to-back 100-yard games the last two weeks and two losses. They lost to a, a good Miami team in a high-scoring 35-32 affair. And then this last weekend, they just lost to the Lions 31-30 in another game. In both those games, he had a 60-plus-yard touchdown run in the game. That can't happen. You yeah. cannot allow the quarterback to yep. run for a touchdown anywhere on the field, but let alone rip one off 60 yards for you. That's part of what you're going to have to deal with is trying to contain him. Now, on the other side of the football, they struggled against the run. In fact, they're, they're in the bottom four or five teams in the league against the run, giving up about 145, 150 yards a game on the ground. Atlanta's number four in the league, even after last weekend or last Thursday night, in rushing the football. There's your area to attack. You yeah. got to get back to your roots and run the football. And when we throw it, let's get them blocked. Give them, give yourself an opportunity. So it stopped their run game. He's averaging about 20 passes a game and about 10 runs a game. And I'm talking about Justin Fields. Yeah. He will affect the game very similarly the way Marcus Mariota tries to affect our game and running it with the quarterback, handing it off, and play actioning. DJ, I want to ask you this question. Back in the day when you were playing. You're a fleet of foot. You mm-hmm. can get outside the pocket. So when you were running with the football, if you wanted to try to attack a defense with your legs, what gave you the most fits? What slowed you down as a quarterback, right? So we can just kind of flip the table, and you put yourself in Justin Field's shoes. What makes you uncomfortable? You know what? I think the number one thing that makes any quarterback uncomfortable is interior pressure. Yeah. Because if – you have guys who are disciplined enough, and that's going to be a big thing that Archer's talked about is discipline in these rush lanes, whether it's the pass or run. 
You have to be disciplined in how you rush this guy. And I think interior pressure always gives any quarterback fits, let alone a guy who wants to move around and run, because you're taught for the longest – Never go backwards. You're told never to go backwards and then try to escape from the outside unless you have to. You always want to climb, climb, climb up in the pocket. And if you climb up in the pocket and you have interior pressure, guess what? That's uncomfortable. You're not going to really be able to see downfield because you got a guy bearing down. He's right in your face. And it's hard for you to step into a throw. Or it's hard to throw because you may hit a, a hand on a helmet, whatever it is. Interior pressure is the number one killer for a quarterback inside the pocket, whether you can run or throw. And if you watch – Justin play you watch any other quarterback who can move like that when you don't have that interior pressure there's always a little lane that you can find if you're thinking about taking off if it's not there because mm-hmm. most of the times the guys in this league are pretty good when they're coming around the edges they know how far you're going to get they know how deep you're going to drop so they get to a point and then they come back or they get to a point and they fall back inside but if you got interior pressure and you're pushing from the middle and then those guys on the outside do a good job of keeping contained. They have like a cage around them. There's really nowhere to go. So the interior pressure is going to be big in this ball game. And, you know, I mean, TQ's played, I thought, pretty well this season. I think, you know, Grady obviously is, is who he is. But if you can find a way to contain and keep him inside the pocket as opposed to him getting on the outside and, and creating, that's going to be a big part of the game as well. So the guys on the edge have to play a huge role in how they rush up field, and then the guys on the inside have to always keep eyes on them. So DJ likes interior pressure. No, I guys, don't. I don't. I don't like it. No. I'm saying that we need the no. Falcons to bring interior <laughs> pressure. Dave, I want to ask you this question because <sighs> I see this sometime in the college game when you have a linebacker that can run. You'll start to see a lot more spy coverage with a linebacker, maybe a safety, when they know they've got an athletic quarterback that's going to run. Probably would have been like a Deion Jones type role because of the way that he can run. Do you think that's something that Atlanta could mix in there, or does that put them susceptible in other areas that they could give up big plays? Well, you have to mix it up. Dean P and I think Dean Pease will employ that because you've got three linebackers that can run. Rashawn Evans, Troy Anderson, and Michael Walker can all run. Mm-hmm. Now, can they run well enough to track this kid down? He's a he, they're very similar. Troy Anderson ran what four four at the combine. That's what this guy ran. Okay, so. It's going to be close. And this is a big dude now. He's 6'3", about 225 pounds. So it's not like you know, you're dragging down a frail quarterback. But you can't let him escape through the middle. If you can shove him to the sidelines, now that extra defender, the sideline comes into play. The pass game is one thing when things break down. Their first play in the game against the Lions is zone read. He runs 25 yards off the left edge for on a zone read play. So when you start talking about edge players playing a huge role in this to mush rush him and keep, kind of keep him in the pocket, they're going to have to be really disciplined and maybe even go back to their college days of how option football works in the zone read because if you crash, he's, he's going to get at least 15 yards on yep. you before you're going to touch him. Yep. So if you can keep him hemmed in, you can see where if you keep him hemmed in against the Lions – there's some indecision in where he wants to throw the football. He tried to make some off throw, balance throws that weren't very good. He put the ball in harm's way a couple of times because he's trying to make off balance. That you want to make him uncomfortable, like Shock said. But it's going to be that whole mush rush. That, that front four or front seven are going to have to be really good this weekend. Just to add one more thing to what Archer's talking about, when they get into that zone read, I think Deans is going to do a really good job of changing the looks of who he has to read. Mm-hmm. Because when you think about his zone read, sometimes you think about, okay, I just read the end. If he crashes, I pull in and go. Well, you can also use the end where he crashes and you got the linebacker to loop around. Or you can keep the end and have, you know, the backer on the inside. You got to find ways to make it look different to him to make him be a little bit indecisive when he has it. So if you can do that and change up the look like Archie talked about in that part of the game, then you got something too. The other thing I'll add too is the defense gets Justin Fields in Chicago into third and long situations. Mm -hmm. You can't go to sleep. I mean, I don't remember, DJ, you were around. Like third and 15 when we had Mike Vick around, like there was people on the sideline that was just like, just run it (laughs) yeah right because you got somebody that's got the speed and elusiveness you can't think oh on third and 15 we good right because this guy can tug it down and he can get it whereas 99 percent of the nfl is probably not going to pick it up so third down got to get off the field yeah and and part of the problem now that chicago has is there's a dude on this side that's just like that Mm -hmm. if a marcus gets out of the pocket he's a problem okay so they're thinking their conversations up in Chicago are very similar to our conversations down here. I say, okay, 
Yeah, he had a tough day this last Thursday, but let's look at the other games. He's gotten out of the pocket. He's bought time. He's found guys. He's also taken off and run with the football. So they've got the same issues with their – and their defense uh, is not playing overly well. Yeah. Their, the strength of their defense is Brisker, the safety. He leads them in sacks. Uh-huh. Jaquan Brisker, the safety from – their, their rookie safety from, uh, from Penn State – is their leading sacker with three? Wow! They've got a rookie middle linebacker that it, it, the Sanborn out of uh, out of Wisconsin that's played well. Roquan Smith, remember, gone. Oh, yep. yep. So they've had to rely on some young players to make plays. What happens to young players? Better have eye discipline. Yeah. And, and and you can get those guys going where they're not supposed to go, and you take advantage of that. So Chicago uh, is up next, three and seven, zero oh and three in their division. And again, don't necessarily want to judge an opponent by the record because I think you could have done the same thing with Carolina last weekend, and we saw how things shook out for Atlanta on that one. If you just want to look at win loss record. This episode in part brought to you by The Home Depot. Everything you need for your next home improvement project is just a tap away on The Home Depot app. The Home Depot app digital toolbox gives you access to how-to guides, project calculators, and image search so you'll know exactly what you need to pick up. With the tap of the finger, you can rent and reserve the right tools for the job. Also, browse through millions of items from top brands that you can have delivered right to your door. Whatever your project, find exactly what you need with the Home Depot app. Download the Home Depot app today. I wanted to ask you guys this question. We're at, you know, obviously well past halfway in the season. And I want to ask you guys, like, who do you think is a surprise player or somebody that has developed, or maybe it's a unit that you felt like has been pretty solid all season long. And it's it's a player or a position group that we can continue to count on as we finish out the season. You know what? There's one guy that came to mind um, when we started talking about this, and obviously it's hard to be clean at this spot because it's an every single down type of position. You got to be good, and yeah, you're gonna have some mistakes here and there. But one guy who I thought has kind of rose to the occasion is Caleb McGarry. Uh-huh. I mean, you look at a guy who came into this season, obviously didn't pick up his fifth year option. A lot of people thinking, okay, this is his last year. He could be gone. He could have easily pouted. He could have easily said, okay, well, this team doesn't believe me. But there's been games where I thought this guy's played to a level that they thought he would when they get when he got drafted. So I'm I'm really encouraged by the way he's played. Now, of course, he's had moments where you know he's been beat or you know he had some bad times in the game. But I thought he's you know kind of rose to the occasion and said, okay, I'm gonna give you guys something else to think about this season with how he's played. Yeah, and I think it's probably good that I go next to piggyback on that because, yeah, we want to sit there and pick at at Marcus Mariota's performance last weekend and and maybe that he didn't get the blocking, the protection up front. But I'm going to stay kind of in that same realm because a guy like McGarry has played well enough that the running game has been really solid this year. And we've seen a guy like Caleb Huntley take advantage of an opportunity Mm -hmm. and take his game to the next level and really provide a boost with, with his power, with his physicality, even he's got some bursts now. I mean, he's a bigger back, but he still has some bursts. And, and I, I really like the rotation because it's like, you see Algier come off the field and he hustles off and Huntley runs. It's like, these guys are very unselfish right now. They understand that this collective group is what makes them good. CP being healthy obviously helps this collective group but I feel like Huntley is taking advantage of an opportunity and he is he is really taking his game to the next level and provided an area that has been a strength all season long Dave what's a, a player or position group that that has stuck out to you Huntley's built like a fire if yeah, fire, <laughs> fire you know just a, one of those ones yeah he's this thick yeah. um I I think that it's been tough on the safeties. I think Jalen Hawkins and Richie Grant have really kind of taken their game to another level. I think that you – now, was it expected? I think you needed it to happen. Yeah, yeah. They, I think they've done that. I mean, think about what they've had to deal with, though. I mean, both corners are gone. Yeah. You've had a nickel out. I mean, so they're the only constant in mm-hmm. the game would have been the two safeties. They've been asked to cover in the slot. They've been asked to blitz. They've been asked to come down in the box and defend the run. And the thing I like about them, and they're really, to me, the future of what the secondary is going to be with A.J. Um, when he gets back, and hopefully he might be back this week at the corner spot. But their ability to what are you kind saying, of – Because last time you said a guy was going to play. A.J.'s back. <laughs> okay, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't, there it is. I have no idea. I have no idea. So, 
<laughs> so those two guys being able to fluctuate back and forth. Okay, I'm going to come or come up and cover in the slot, whether it's tight end back out of the backfield. I'm going to blitz. But their ability to both do kind of the the back end as well as the front end, their versatility. To me, that that really bodes well for this defense moving forward from a future standpoint as you begin to build around some guys. I think the two safeties have played at a pretty high level. I just want to add one quick thing to that, and I think it's a great point because you look at this season, you watch the things that Dean Pease does with his defense, and if you don't have those two guys back there who can make the calls or who can get guys in position, it's going to be tough on your defense. And Dean has so many different looks yeah. at his defense. It's so multiple week in and week out. And if those two guys don't have it, it's going to be really tough on a, a coordinator trying to make those calls. Yeah, and I don't want to throw a guy under the bus here, but he's not here anymore, so I'll throw him under the bus. <laughs> Jalen Hawkins isn't the guy that got beat on that deep shot. Okay, yeah. that's that's Jalen Hawkins' replacement was in the game at that time. We get beat over the top by D.J. Moore for the touchdown in the Carolina game here. I don't think that happens if Hawkins is in the game. Yeah. Mm. So, um, and that's just just my just a couple of two cents worth there. I just think the two safeties have played pretty solidly. Yeah. Um, what well, final thing I wanted to discuss? Sometimes we get so, and everybody does. We we get so dialed into X's and O's, results, wins, losses. And every once in a while you forget that like NFL players are still human beings. They still have real life situations that's going on. Go back to last Thursday, Jake Matthews, him and his (laughs) wife are expecting a baby. Yeah. (laughs) And if I read it correctly, they had it scheduled for Sunday. So they were playing on Thursday. They're going to be back late Thursday night, early Friday morning. Should be just fine on um, Sunday to have his baby. Well, that's not the case. Gets a phone call Thursday morning from his wife. Apparently, he had missed like 13 calls on his phone. His phone rings in his hotel room. And you guys know this. Like, when a phone rings in a hotel, you Never like, have his way. Yeah. Excuse me? What? Yeah. So, that's what Jake <laughs> says. He's like, I'm wondering why my hotel phone is ringing. Picks it up. His wife had to go to the hospital. Um, has, his ba- has, his bo- has his baby. Comes back. Gets to the game in time. Basically, runs into the stadium with shorts and a t-shirt. Um, but an exciting moment for him and his wife. Um, but I wanted to ask you guys, like, you ever have any stuff like this happen or to teammates when you guys were playing where it was like somebody all of a sudden had to leave town because of uh, an, uh, expecting a baby or something along those lines They had to run back in the last second? First off, let's uh, let's say thank you to Arch for allowing Jake to use his plane. That yeah, was really, yeah. I wish you really, were such really, a team really, player. Such a hey, good guy, man. That Jets, good, good deal. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little plug. How come uh, he hasn't let us borrow? It? I don't know, man. It's, you know, you know, it's yeah. I've never had a player have to do that during. And, and let's let's get on Jake and, and his wife. Maggie is his wife named Maggie. Mag, Maggie. Yeah, yeah. Let's get on both of them. You can't have a kid during the season. Okay, it's bad by Jake okay. right here, right? You, you, you gotta have better work, planning. Work on, huh? work, work on a, a night during the week to build the kid during the season, but the kid's gotta come in the off season. You can't have the kid during the year. That's a complete blow up on his part. I gotta that's lie. Like, I gotta lie. That's I like getting married over here. Like we gotta look at the calendar, <laughs> yeah, yeah. dude. Like he's gotta pull it's like having a calendar. My kids like a fall my, wedding. My kids are you are, kidding me? My kids were in March and April, so it worked out. You know what I mean? <laughs> Got to have good planning, man. Yeah. There you go. I, I would like I would like to throw out a uh, a big kudos to Brand uh, Brandon Ruth who handles our logistics on the road for us because Brandon went overtime here. Okay, so Jake's leaving. You don't know when Jake's coming back. <laughs> okay, so now they have to get Harrison, a guy they just signed, and Schaefer, the kid out of Georgia, were back in Atlanta. They had to get them to the game. Okay, so he had to rent a car and have the car delivered here to a here to Flowery Branch within an hour yeah. to get them driven up there. Couldn't get a flight for him or anything, yeah. so they drive them up there to get them to the game in case Jake can't make it back. So we have enough people to actually play right. on the offensive line. And then, of course, you give an assist to the big guy, Mr. Blank. He's the guy that got him back here. Oh, got it, him was, back. it wasn't our oh, no. point. <laughs> he he, he lent it to Arthur. Brandon had he to, have a, Brandon had to well. have a car to get him there. So. Brandon Ruth, who does an amazing job with that all his travel crazy. stuff. Man, that's crazy. With all the things that go on with the team. This was above and beyond, dude. <laughs> Medal of Honor for you. Phenomenal for effort to try to get everybody where they needed to be. Jake sees his, sees his baby born and gets back for the game. Uh, just an cre- incredible effort. Now, the it, game didn't turn out the way he wanted to, but that was a W for Brandon yes, Ruth. Unbelievable. 100%. You see him running in at 7 o'clock with his flip-flops on and running <laughs> into the locker room. I mean – 
It's unbelievable. I've never had anything close to that in my career of anybody done something like that and made to turn it around. So I'm glad we weren't on the West yeah. Coast or something like oh, that. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that didn't happen to me either. But if I remember correctly, I didn't have a chance to get to Finn. But I almost remember one time I was getting on a plane and Brian Finner and his wife called. One of his seven. And yeah. we were literally walking down the jetway. And he turned around and went back out. Oh, man. And I think it was because one of his kids was, was about to be born, and, and he ended up flying and make got? it to the game. Was he got, seven? Uh, six, seven, <laughs> I don't know. Finn, I'll text Finn, you later. Finn, I'll make sure yeah. I'm right on that one. <laughs> Starting All right, that's going to do it, guys, uh, because me and Shock and Arch have a uh, flight to catch on Dave's plane here. Let's do um, it. I don't know where we're going, but we're Vegas, just gonna, baby. Let's we're go. just going to cruise. I guess apparently <laughs> we're going to Vegas. <laughs> hey, wait a minute. Real quickly before we go. <laughs> The dogs, the dogs have qualified for the championship game against LSU. <laughs> Dare we revisit this man's championship moment? Was a monster in a game. A SEC Player of the Year. Shock went off for the dogs. Beat LSU in the building right down here. Now it was the Georgia Dome at the time. That's okay. But, but my guy, my guy went off. I had to get you a little cuts. I appreciate that. I know well, we're going to be I'll pay you after. I'll pay you after. I'll pay you after. We'll, we'll talk about it again, but I had to give you that. I appreciate <laughs> oh, it. Oh, man. I appreciate it. Uh, so, yes, UGA, <laughs> LSU will be in the SEC championship. Got to give uh, DJ a little bit of love, and maybe we'll revisit some of those highlights uh, yeah. on the next couple of weeks All leading right. up to yeah. the Bring SEC the championship game. All right, Atlanta got Chicago Bears on the docket next. Let's see if they can rebound after a couple of stumbles, get back in the win column, and continue to make a run at this NFC South division. That's going to do it, everybody. The Falcons Audible presented by AT&T. That's Arch. That's DJ. I'm D-Rack. Those are uh, nicknames for you today. We'll see you next time. <laughs> Thanks so much for watching on whatever platform you check us out on.